Hi, my name is Chris Kanansky. I'm the editor of the Des Moines Business Record. Uh, we're here today to do a, a, another one of our live events, and uh, what we're trying to do with these uh, events is explore four different areas of real estate and development. Uh, these videos are going to all appear, uh, and the, the transcripts from them are going to be in our annual real estate guide, which is a new product for us. It will be handed out at our event on April 20th, and also be in the April 29th edition of the Business Record. Um, Today's event, what we're hoping to do is, is focus in on the retail segment of, of real estate and development. And uh, with us today, we've got a great panel that we're going to be able to do. I'm going to be addressing the camera right now after this, uh, after I'm done introducing it, and I'll be turning it over to Kent Dar, our, our real estate development reporter. Um, after that point, we're not going to be looking back at the camera. And where that kind of comes from is we've done a number of live events, and we usually bring the panelists in in advance. And we go ahead and we, we talk about some of the topics and questions. It's always some of the best conversation. And so our goal today is to have a discussion amongst ourselves and invite you to kind of be that fly on the wall. Um, so you'll see me taking notes, Ken taking notes as well, as, as we're going to be utilizing this for content and for future story ideas. Um, but we enjoy uh, welcome you to, to be that fly on the wall today. So with us today, we've got a great panel that's going to be helping us out. Um, directly to my left, we have Steve Scott, who's the Senior Vice President for NAI Optimum. We have Marcus Pitts, the Senior Vice President at JL. We have Tyler Dingle, he's the First Vice President and Retail Specialist at uh, Hubble Commercial. We have Chris Murray, who's the President and CEO of Denny Elwell Company. And Teresa Greenfield, the President of Colby Interest. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Kent Dar. He's a real estate development reporter. Uh, he's been writing with uh, us for about seven years now, and uh, I don't want to date you, 40 years as a reporter. So he's got some time. Uh, time he's got go, ahead, Ken. go ahead, Kent, kick it off. Well, let's just uh, let's start off and uh, just give us a general idea of uh, what you see coming in, in 2016, what, what the major trends are, uh, uh, what's happening downtown, what's happening in the suburbs. Steve? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Uh, first of all, I'd say I'm, I'm really not very involved in downtown retail. <coughs> Obviously, the, the IV project is going to be a game changer downtown. It's uh, very interesting and good to see grocery. Uh, hopefully that will spur some more downtown living. Um, you know, it's, uh, you need you need uh, consumer services to be able to generate additional uh, population growth downtown. But I don't know what the number is as far as the number of residents living downtown. Maybe it's 10,000 in that, that vicinity. Maybe somebody has a good number on that. Um, that isn't going to drive a lot of the kind of retail, national retail necessarily, that a lot of us work uh, within. Uh, it's probably more daily services and more quick service restaurant. Uh, restaurants are, I think, interested in downtown, doing, doing very well. Um, but uh, but most of the work that we do is uh, probably more uh, suburban, more big box and, and uh, junior uh, anger uh, type retailers. I'm talking about uh, retailers like a big sporting goods or a grocery store, or, um, you know, or the, uh, the big boxes being Walmart and Target. And, uh, you know, I think in those areas, there are there's some interest uh, further in uh, the Des Moines market. Um, Western suburbs, far west suburbs. We have some interest in the Waukee uh, from both Target and Walmart out there. Uh, so I think you'll see some opportunistic uh, growth in big box. Um, and then of course we're also involved in uh, the Prairie Crossing development in Altoona. And uh, a lot of the retail there I think is going to be driven by the, uh, by the outlet mall that's coming in. And I was thinking about this the other day. You look at the existing retail that's in Altoona today around that 8th Street interchange and there's call it 500,000 square feet uh, existing today with the Walmart Supercenter, the Target, the uh, Lowe's, the Menards, and then the, uh, you know, the adjoining peripheral retail to that. Add in Bass Pro Shops, another 150,000 square feet. Um, so with that existing retail, the outlet mall is, they're talking 330,000 square feet. Uh, and then right along with that, uh, we're representing uh, the Heart of America uh, organization. And uh, they are planning another 400,000 square feet adjoining the uh, outlet mall. So you'll be within two to three years, a million and a half square feet of retail, right within a half mile uh, uh, radius. And so that's that's going to be a game changer in Eastern Polk County. I think, and I, I do want to come back to, to both Prairie Crossing and, and Prairie Trail. Uh, uh, Marcus has been involved with it. In, in general, Marcus, what are, what are you seeing? Obviously, I'm thank you with the Prairie Trail development. We touch on some projects uh, with JLL uh, here in, uh, in downtown Des Moines, both uh, um, you know, 801, some of the retail availabilities there on the first and second floor. Uh, Ruan's uh, holdings down here, we do a lot with Nelson and 
some of the other developers, but you know we're seeing I'd echo uh, Steve's thoughts on downtown. I mean we're seeing local retailers uh, coming in, local restaurants. You know as the, the um, some of the, the we call it the B and C product uh, gets repurposed in downtown. It's either being filled back to the office or um, some sort of a multifamily. And as that product fills, um, you know this this first and second floor retail. Uh, becomes more high in demand, and a lot of these buildings. I mean, there's 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 good traction in downtown right now. It's it's it's, it's really 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 amazing to see. So um, had some success there, and then obviously you know as, as you mentioned the, the Prairie Trail development. You know we're the Plaza Shops area, uh, which is anchored by Ivy. I think all in will probably have about 100,000 square foot of retail developed just within that uh, that uh, subsection. Uh, we've got about 60,000 out of ground so far. So we're 60% of the way through that. Uh, the district, which is uh, the large area, kind of the, the heart of the of, of the development, so to speak, um, you know, all in that, that portion is going to be three to 400,000 square foot. We've developed probably close to 150,000 of that. Um, so somewhere between, I wouldn't say half, but, you know, I, I'd say we're probably a third of the way through the way that's going to look. And, um, you know, keep in mind, other than high B, uh, you know, in the district in particular, we've managed to fill that with, with strong local restaurants, strong local retailers, all without really an anchor up there. So obviously the, the city of Ankeny has their city their civic component with the uh, um, referendum coming up and then that, the new library slash civic uh, building that will be uh, um, completed probably late 2018 or early 2019. That's really the first big anchor there that we've announced, you know, so, uh, and we are in talks, uh, we've been in talks for several years now, but we are in talks with some other large uh, anchors that I think this year we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully get some traction with, so. Well, from looking from my team perspective, we do a lot of tenant rep work, and so we're representing a lot of these retailers out in the market, and, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to, to see the amount of demand out there seems to be um, exceeding the supply, and obviously that's having an upward impact on some of the rents out there. Um, particularly if you look at the, the QSR market or the quick serve retail restaurant uh, group, there's uh, a lot of groups out there looking for class A retail, looking for end caps, drive throughs, patios, that type of a product. And it's really hard to find. Um, and the new product that does come online, it seems that uh, it gets uh, absorbed pretty quickly, especially on the ends. You'll see those ends fill up quickly, and, and sometimes you'll have a little bit of a little bay left. Um, but I, I've experienced that having a, a upward impact on those rents. I, I sent out a, a letter of intent just this week, a response back that was, you know, probably five or six dollars a square foot higher than I, than any letter of intent I've ever negotiated. Um, and I think that's a product again of the, the land pricing, the construction costs, um, which are, are extremely high or as high as they've ever been, and then just the overall um, lack of, uh, of a good product out there. The other thing that, that we're seeing is um, there's a little bit of a disconnect between if you look at what we would call the A, what we call A position centers versus the B position centers. But I've seen that A product start to rise, the rents start to rise, the, the occupancies are, are very strong. That B product seems to really still kind of, kind of be lagging. Um, I haven't seen a lot of upward movement on those rents and, and, and absorption or occupancy has been tough to, to get that number to, to rise at all. So it'll be interesting to see how that, how that uh, uh, plays out over the next year. So what's an example of B product? Yeah, yeah. Um, it might be a great question to draw. Yeah, I was going to say, that's, that, that, I'm trying to make sure I don't offend any clients, uh, current or, or future, but, um, you know, I would say from a, from a retailer perspective, and we were talking about this earlier, when groups come into the market, new retailers come into the market, their, their focus is always on that western suburb, looking at the Jordan Creek area. Just, that's, that's where you see a lot of the national brands, and so you see a lot of the groups kind of focus on that area. So if you look at some of the B products, I'll just look at maybe like Southeast 14th uh, Street and South, what used to be a South, uh, South Ridge or South Ridge Mall there. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those retailers, rents there, you're, you're gonna see um, in the low double digits per square foot. Um, so I would, I would say that that would be a good example of class B product. Now if you look at that same type of retailer, same type of space, um, I don't know, like Jordan Creek or Mill Civic or University, um, those rents are gonna be uh, going into the mid, Upper 20s pretty quickly, um, so that, that would be, I guess that would be a good example. You know, the other interesting thing is there's uh, in retail there's, there's a lot of good success stories, a lot of groups that are that are uh, 
expanding and looking for, for new space. Uh, but we have had two groups that have gone the other direction. Sports Authority just uh, just filed this week for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Um, they're going to be closing, um, I think it was 60 some stores across the way. And the, and the uh, West and White store is not on the list. Was not on the list. Oh, yeah, not, so our, was finish line, did I see something on the finish line? Yeah, fin uh, finish line. We're working with um, Sertage right now, uh, who is the landlord for a lot of the, the Sears and Kmart stores. Um, across the across the country, and, and we've got um, three, four different locations here in Iowa that uh, have stores that will be coming uh, becoming available. So there are some groups that are that are still struggling. Struggling. I think that's uh, some of that is a product of uh, that uh, trend to move to the omnichannel online type of a, of a retail concept. If they can go online and, and buy it for the convenience of their of their home, um, those types of goods and services. I think those groups are struggling. A little bit. Industrial space, as a general rule, is a lot cheaper than retail storefront. So if you, if you can increase your online presence and sell the sell the product online uh, and store the product in, in a four or five dollar industrial space, you're not paying the, the teens and twenties on, on the retail storefront. So as more to Chris's point earlier, shrinking their shrinking their, their, their local presence and increasing the online. So. But on the other hand, apparently if you have both spaces, I, I think Tim Sharp and they're, they're making 70 cents on the dollar on, on, on what they're selling online through e-commerce. But if you have a storefront, the same company has a storefront, and you buy something that you need to return to exchange, they're making a dollar seven because you're coming in and maybe exchanging for a higher price. Yeah, and I, I find that a really interesting uh, number. Yeah, and that's, that's a trend you see in, in, in the retail world. They, they refer to it as omnichannel. Retail, um, and basically what it means is just is just being able to utilize not only online shopping, mobile shopping, um, in-store pickup, and that's kind of what uh, we were referred to in the survey was if if they can have somebody buy a product online, but register it for for in-store pickup versus delivery. When that person goes in to pick up their product, they're going to pick up three or four other items while they're while they're there because it's convenient. Um, so that's what's driving that that. Uh, that gain on, on their on their sales. Things all over the all over the place. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I guess uh, I'll put on my developer hat a little bit. Um, you know, I, I look at uh, you know B and C locations right now as opportunistic. Uh, you can buy more than you can build if you understand the market. Uh, there are, there is an audience to occupy those spaces, and uh, again, that requires local presence, local, local expertise, and, and, and the capital to do so. Uh, I'll use an example, uh, you know, I, I view East University between uh, Hubble and the fairgrounds as an up and coming development area. Uh, several years ago we acquired a center along that corridor, uh, looks like Broadlands has uh, picked up ground, they're going to put a, a clinic there uh, as they move to a reduced tax model, more of a for-profit type medical uh, facility. Uh, that, that area is going to, uh, I, I believe that area will redevelop itself. Uh, you know, I take a Governor's Square in West Des Moines, take uh, a Dolls Building in Ames, or a Dolls Building in Ankeny, and, and you know, I'll be the first to admit, not everything works out exactly how you'd hope. I mean, I've had that Dolls Building for two years and probably talked to everybody in this panel about opportunities, uh, but, but things are moving along, you know. I mean, we've created two out lots, we have a restaurant that's going to open, the center that is close to being announced, a uh, small food production facility, and uh, the north side of, uh, of Ankeny in this case uh, continues to evolve and develop very, very quickly. It's follow housing, it's following housing to Marcus's project that he works with, uh, Prairie Trail. Um, that, that, that knot's getting tied, so to speak, between the Prairie Trail and the northeast quadrant and the northwest quadrant of, of Ankeny. And so, uh, as you talk about neighborhood services, we're seeing a lot of activity and development in that market. Uh, and then if you jump to the south side of Ankeny along the, the corridor where the Nationals are, Delaware Avenue, uh, you know, I, I think to Steve's point that uh, northeast Polk counties, you know, there's there's poised to be a lot happening there. Um, there's 100 acres that lies between Corporate Woods Interchange and Sam's Club, and that, that's poised for development. Uh, you see the project in Altoona that's happening. You know, Ames is starting to do some annexation looking at their development out along the 13th Street corridor a little bit more now. Their uh, council makeup uh, 
is, has become a little bit more progressive than it, than it had been. And uh, Ames is a hot market along the Duff Corridor, but we, we, we just looking out on that, that regional, kind of that regional development. Um, so I, I think that from a development standpoint, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And I know the Nationals, a lot of the Nationals coming in, you know, West Des Moines and, and that Jordan Creek area is, is hot. Yeah. It's, it's the first place everybody looks when they come. Is Ames ever going to get its regional mall? Uh, I, I don't. I, I think there will be a regional development um, in the future. I just don't think it will be a regional mall as uh, was already previously shared. Yeah, I want to echo some of what Chris just said regarding the neighborhood centers. The majority of our portfolio is those B, C neighborhood centers, and we have the lowest vacancy we've had in Asia, so well below the um, CBRE market spend. Um, so what are we seeing? Well, I think that. Consumers, shoppers need goods and services, data goods and services, and they're looking for those in a convenient location. Um, not only do they want to sit at multiple stoplights to get to it, um, they want to get there quickly, easy access, uh, they want to see it from the road, so the location is important, and then move on with the rest of their errands for the day. So we have really seen a lot of growth in our portfolio, filling up the space, and all local tenants primarily, um, many of them wanting to expand. Uh, we've been doing some shuffling from one center to another to help them grow. Um, so I agree, I think there's a lot of opportunity. It's a different market though than the national, um, national tenants, and it certainly serves a different shopper. What, what, types, of, uh, what types of businesses are those? Is it a mix, but when yeah, you it's, the primary? It's, it's daily goods and services. Yeah. So it's nails, it's hair, it's uh, some fitness places. We've had, we had a, uh, an ethnic grocery store that doubled in size, and they just are booming. Um, they serve a lot of um, the community, and they run a, a nice shop, and they've got a very good reputation in town. So it's, it's those kinds of, of uses. Yeah, I might just add in here, one of the, what I see as one of the hottest retail segments <clears throat> that is growing is value retail. A couple of years ago, luxury retail was very hot, and I think you're seeing that slow down. Uh, Macy's is closing stores, a lot of the value uh, retailers are backfilling those spaces. And by value retail, uh, that could be dollar stores, you know, family dollar, dollar general, dollar tree. They're expanding very, very rapidly. And those types of retailers, uh, Goodwill is a client of ours, they're very, very active. Um, they, they are looking for spaces that as long as the center is well located, good traffic counts, good access points, it doesn't matter where it's, where it's at. So to your point, Chris, East University, that's, that there's always going to be tenants that will want those kind of locations. They don't I, have to be for free. I think something that drives that, and that maybe is unknown or a bit of a mystery, is the millennials. And um, because being thrifty is hip. Sure. And they are very interested in the Aldi's when it comes to national brands, and they're interested in the Goodwills and the consignment stores. And these are double income families, young family formation. Could they spend more? Probably. But they don't want to spend it. Um, and services. Maybe they're spending it on vacations, or I'm not sure what they're spending it on, but but it, 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 it has a little bit of a hip vibe to it that I think we're seeing in our uh, centers some of that growth and occupancy. I think, uh, to your point there, the, the, some of that savings, I think you're seeing that transition into some of these restaurants. And you've yeah. seen a lot of restaurants um, open up and, and, and open up strong and do well. And we're seeing a lot of that where, where they're saving a little bit of money on some of their, their, their goods that they may buy and spending it on the, the entertainment and the, uh, the restaurant side. Um, I did want to touch quickly on, on Chris's comment with the, um, the opportunity in some of that B and C class. Uh, I talked about some of the things that are pushing those rents is construction costs, and, and you touched on this as well. As the ability to, to get into a shopping center at say 40 or 50 dollars a square foot for the building you can go out and recreate that for you I mean you're going to spend three or four times that to re recreate that center so that's where there's there's that that opportunity where you can compete um, at a price point um, in, a, in a market that, uh, that that needs those services there's rooftops there's uh, there's consumers in those areas and and i think that's where you know, that opportunity is at but how do you decide? I mean, do, are you just taking a chance? You, you buy Gov Governor Square, maybe, maybe would have been a pretty good bet. Uh, yeah. Park Fair, Governor Square, Park Fair is a great example. Uh, look what Richard Hurts doing on Ingersoll. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, 
the Office Max, uh, a family dollar building there, and then uh, uh, it took, put the retail center in front. I mean, he, if, if there's a strong retail market, the demand's there. Um, you can usually make work with that product, uh, whatever that product looks like, by, by either tearing it down and building new, and, and in that case was the uh, Firehouse sub building. But uh, you can reposition some of that existing product, and, and uh, some of it's just hasn't been cared for. So Richard's been a, an absolute yeah. genius on that. He's done a great job yeah. along here, Saul. And uh, you know, I think the, the key to it is really understanding the market, being able to explain to somebody from out of town the value of a marketplace, whether that's you know, your Saul Avenue, East University, Highland Park. Um, you know, the fact that it, you know, with, if, if you look at the mm -hmm. rooftop count, um, there's still a populace of people that need served, and although the needs may be a little bit different, they're generally the same. And uh, you know, I always use the Starbucks Starbucks example uh, when when I redeveloped Park Fair Mall, uh, you know, different time, but the uh, question came up: Well, could a Starbucks survive in Highland Park? And I always said, Yes, it could. I said the payment method's just different. You know, they're paying with cash, where other segments of the market are paying with credit card. And so I think that, that that just you just need to be mindful of that uh, when you go in and talk about a brand new construction in, in Waukee or Jordan Creek. I mean, to to Marcus and Tyler's point, you know, 120 to 150 bucks a square foot uh, going vertical with the ground, and you can you can buy that 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 Governor Square, that Park Fair, and uh, you can do a lot for that. Month. It's a a very rapidly growing population of the Greater Des Moines area. And I think all of us at this, uh, at this during this part of this conversation realize that that's an audience that we're catering to. We're looking at opportunities to serve those people because uh, they have needs just like everybody else. And uh, you know, the, the makeup of the Des Moines uh, landscape is different. We have millennials, we have uh, different ethnicities. You look at our restaurant makeup, you're seeing more Indian restaurants pop up. Uh, so that tells me that uh, our palates are changing. How much does what what how big of a role does this uh, municipal expectations play and what you're doing there? It seems to me that if you're doing a project in downtown Des Moines, uh, the city pretty much expects a mixed use retail on the first floor and, and apartments above. Uh, I, I think there's something similar maybe going on going on on the north end of uh, Kettlestone. City's helping or hurting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I can just. <laughs> I'm putting one on the trail, spot. Prairie yeah. Trail standpoint, you know, mm -hmm. City of Ankeny's been a great partner uh, with us on Prairie Trail. And, you know, we, we do have a mixed use concept in the district where, you know, we've got the retail storefronts on the first level and the and the uh, office users on the second. You know, on Building One, uh, we're 100% occupied on our office uh, uh, our office space on the second floor. Building Two, uh, we're committed to. I'll say about 80 percent right now and that's on a building that is set to be delivered call it midsummer you know so we're, we're, we're seeing the pre-leasing activity on these mixed use products uh, um, it's, 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 it's at least in the AK market it seems to be very uh, uh, very positive so we're but personally I feel like we're having some success there now I can't speak to how that's going in other segments in the market but uh, um, working with the city of Ankeny, you know there's a specific component at uh, at, uh, at the district as well, they've, they've been a, just a great partner. I would say that it's it's hard a lot of times for national retailers to understand how mixed use works, <clears throat> and it's very expensive to build those kind of products because you get to go anytime you go vertical, you incur the cost of elevators and uh, stair shafts, and the mechanical systems are different and they're very complicated. So, you know, there your, your rents are going to be higher, and then on top of that. You know, to an extent, if you're doing that in a location where people aren't really used to that, um, you've seen mixed-use projects that have been brought online over the last 10 to 15 years that have failed um, because you had the situation where um, the customer is expected to park behind the retail space. And that's just not the way that we live in Des Moines, at least. Urban areas, downtown Des Moines, those kind of things work because they have to work. Uh, Chicago, they'll work because they have to work there. But you try to do that in the suburbs, and it gets to be very, very difficult. 
because the national retailers just don't, you know, they like to have their customers be able to park at the front door. They like to be able to control how the cash route works. They want their customer to check out near the front door. They don't want to have to control the back door entrance because it's just very, very difficult. But by control, I mean you, you need to make sure that you're you're opening yourself up to you know uh, shoplifting and stealing and or theft, those kind of things when you have multiple entrances to the store. So national retailers struggle with that. And it's, it's difficult yeah. to get accepted. And from a from a presence standpoint, um, you know, when I'm working with a lot of these groups, they come in and they have a they have a box. They they know exactly what they want to look like, how wide they, they need to be. Um, very specific on that, how they want their storefront to look. And they struggle with finding a presence with having a multi-store product. Um, so you know, I had this conversation the other day when a developer approached and said, hey, would, would you know, Papa Lee South is one that we're working with right now. Would Papa Lee look at this product if we, you know, if we gave them the signage, if we tried to you know, do something with the facade to make them stand out. But th at the end of the day, um, they look, they, Papa will look across their portfolio and say, no, in this type of market, we, we want to be on the end cap. We don't want anybody above us. We want to drive through. And um, they just, you know, that's what that's what they're used to. That's what they found success with. They don't want to change the mold. And, and they can make that call, I mean, yeah. I'm assuming, yeah. Then we've elevated the conversation about urbanization, mixed use. What are we going to be in 50 years through uh, a couple different campaigns, tomorrow plan, capital cost load. And those are, interesting ideas and the tension comes between how do you take some of those ideas and implement them today um, with not only how you meet the needs of the retailers but just physically make those developments work. work. They tend to be, in, in my opinion, successful where there is already sort of urban story core and then you mean, naturally growing out from that. But to introduce it not an organic way into a suburban <coughs> setting is, is very difficult. Very, very difficult. It's, it oftentimes doesn't include all the other amenities, so I say that help make those mixed use development successful. So whether it's new <coughs> libraries, schools, civic investment, enormous parks, now you've created a place. And that's different than just a mixed use building um, that every community dreams about um, in a particular corner. And those are some of the elements that exist in more historic urban cities. The, uh, the, the public features, the improvements along the river, the connectedness with the grid system, um, all of those help support the success of mixed use that maybe aren't quite there yet out in Waukee, but time will tell and we'll see what happens. We're, we're fortunate in the AK market. There's a demand in the AK. Um, uh, Derek Moore, that the city helped uh, draft down a stat. They did that. Uh, they, they did a, a, a study in the state last year. There's 750 million dollars of leakage for consumer goods uh, from the city of Ankeny. And that's not saying that all goes to West Point, but that's just out of the city of Ankeny. And out of that, there's 60 million dollars in leakage from in the food and beverage industry. So that's 60 million dollars per year in revenue out of Ankeny that's being spent on food and beverage outside of outside of the walls of Ankeny. So. That's, uh, you know, I think there's, um, we feel good, we hear numbers like that, and we feel good about, obviously, um, what we're doing at Prairie Trail, and, and uh, um, I'm sure, Chris, with the different things you're going up there, I mean, those are, those are at least for that, sub that submarine, those are, those are encouraging stats to, to hear, you know, so. I think shoppers like an experience, and, um, and so whether it's mixed use or it's destination shopping or it's Des Moines, I, I think there's just different, different uh, shopping outings, <laughs> shall I say. So there's very relevant, I call it daily goods and services. Um, we have to see a lot of that market. There's folks who are looking somewhere to spend the day and have a um, entertainment retail experience, I, for lack of a better word to call it. And I think there's room in the marketplace for all of that. <coughs> And, but not every, I guess I don't believe every building style fits in every single one of those situations or in every location. So you just have to be careful about the conversation with communities. Um, they're sophisticated. Uh, most of the communities we've dealt with are, have, have been wonderful. They really do understand the difference between um, locations that have opportunities for urbanization and more uh, vertical mixed use development and others that 
maybe you just need to serve the neighborhood, be accessible. I can see you're kind of alluding to the, the leakage from leaving the community. So is that something the cities are, are really taking a look at right now, trying to find ways to? I, I don't make it so the residents don't have. Oh, to I, I would. I would think every city's doing that. Yeah. I don't think they're especially proactive on it. Um, um, just trying to provide the um, provide the uh, amenities. You know, as you hit on earlier, I mean, to provide the amenities there that the community wants. You know. And, um, so yes, I would say in the AP market in particular, yes. I mean, I, I, I toss it around to the group that are doing that dealing a lot more in different markets. I mean, are you seeing some of the same? Or are they doing? Are they proactive on some of those studies? Or how's that going? Uh -huh. So project, and that's been one of the driving forces out there. The city is very willing to help out. They've done some amazing things in providing infrastructure to uh, support uh, you know the new development. Uh, Kettlestone, for those who don't know, is the uh, the area. Uh, north essentially from the new uh, Grand Prairie Parkway interchange at I-80. It's about a 1,500 acre area and I've seen Waukee go to extreme lengths and, and be very supportive in terms of assisting with infrastructure, creating different districts, um, and it's because they see uh, leakage coming out of there. They, they see there's uh, definite benefit to the city. To you almost every time. Time. Absolutely. Yeah. What kind of retail, uh, what does a retailer who who drives that corridor, pretty long corridor right now, and open, and, and I mean, they, they've got to ask you, I, I'm assuming that, you know, we everyone that the old saw is uh, rooftops for retail, I, I mean, it, it, does Joaquin need to build out a little bit more, to see a little bit more residential? Uh, well, I, I can tell you, Kent, the, the, the retailers we've mentioned that are looking at that area <clears throat> to see the population all seen this Milwaukee being the fastest growing uh, community in the state percentage wise mm -hmm. and that that is converting to a lot of population growth out there so yes they they, they look in advance because the deal pipeline for a large retailer uh, today you know there are retailers that are, are uh, looking at upcoming stores that they're in 2018 for a long time. so it's it isn't that they're looking to build a store next year or this year uh, their, their pipeline is full for the next two years there's a much longer lead time, so they're looking at the, the intended and the expected population growth, and they, they can see it coming. You can build a lot of houses and apartment buildings. But can. Uh, but plus, I, I guess you're in a unique situation, too, and but now that the interchange is open, I, I mean, you're, uh, it's a short job uh, to, to get to that area. So. We're, we're seeing that up at in Ankeny as well. I mean, Ankeny's growing at five people per day. I think it's the, the you know, in Ankeny's hit some milestones this year in the retail world of, uh, um, you know, population. I think the special census last year was a population of 54,000 uh, in, the, in the town of Ankeny or city of Ankeny. Um, you know, and, and at, at Prairie Trail, I think we've got, I'm going I'm to misquote here, please please check my stats on this, but three or four um, schools. We have uh, DMAC there, we've got Simpson College. So. I think we're, uh, and that's all kind of right within that, that Prairie Trail uh, compound. So um, the apartments, we've got, uh, I think, 300 units that's under construction now. I think in the pipeline, probably about 104. I know we're doing another uh, uh, student housing project uh, with DMAC there. Uh, all in all, that'll be about 600 beds. So a lot of, uh, lot of growth there. And then on the, on, the, on the residential side, on the lot sales, I'm not sure where we're at on completed homes because I don't really deal in that but I know on the stuff west of State Street we're I think for we're, we're probably halfway through uh, halfway through uh, those lots as far as completed homes goes we'll uh, put the home show here last year and then again again I think it was 2008 but all in all where I'm going with this is when Prairie Trail is fully developed they're they're on that thousand 1100 acres whatever you call it uh, they're, they're anticipating a population Prairie Trail alone uh, of around 10,000 people, and that would put us, that would put Prairie Trail in the top 10% of, of towns in Ankeny is that alone, and keep in mind, that's inside of the city of Ankeny, so um, I think we're, that's why we've had some of the success in the early goings, is the retailers are seeing, hey, this this is coming, Dennis is pushing this, and, and uh, this eventually will be there, so that, I think that's why we've had a lot of success, success is the foresight of some of these local retailers. We've done some national deals there with you know, your McDonald's and uh, things of that nature, but it, it, you know, 
really our, our bread and butter to date has been strong local and office users. So Prairie Trail, if you look at Ankeny proper, uh, from a housing count, likely could account for what is complete about 20% of the population of, of Ankeny residential. But that's 80%. And if you look at the growth of, of Ankeny, I don't know when the last time any of you drove on the east side of 35, the number of houses over there is unbelievable. Uh, the school district's looking at an elementary school on the east side of 35. Uh, you know, Prairie Trail has an elementary school, you know, a high school is part of that. The, the demand in those communities, and I think the question earlier was, um, you know, how, how do you position and, and look at these communities? The, the problem, one of the issues we have as a state, our population isn't growing. If you look at our, our county, the state of Iowa, so the question is, is where is everyone coming from? And what communities are being served? And there are winners and there are losers. And uh, I think identifying those winners early, as uh, Steve said, you know, they have retailers looking out there, whether it's Walmart or, or, or Target, you know, they're looking in Waukee. Uh, how Waukee and Georgia Creek compete will be interesting to see. Uh, it'll be less than approximately a mile a piece uh, apart. But, uh, you know, with rising construction prices, with limited sub labor uh, outperforming uh, work, um, you know, those schedules are being slow down and anybody who's worked with the large nationals realizes that you know, there's a very typically a very aggressive schedule and uh, so I think going back to, to some issues that are going to arise it's uh, you know which which communities are going to be winners and which communities are going to be losers and I think you know when you talk about municipalities the, the municipalities that are easy to get along with that are proactive and want development are going to win those that want to have you know, a checker, check the checker, uh, and have, you know, extensive bureaucratic processes to have things approved, they're not going to win. And they're not going to see the, the fruit of, of the labor of the developing community and these retailers coming to town. And we talk about leakage. See, every community wants to keep that leakage in. You know, every, look at the, the, uh, the staff. Every city in the metro has an economic development coordinator. That's, that's a big change from 10 years ago. And uh, they're being progressive. They're working with brokers, they're working with developers, trying to figure out ways to win. And uh, you know, from a municipality standpoint, that's what it's going to take to, to, to move things forward. It's a progressive, forward thinking, easy to get along with council planning, its own commission, and city staff. It, 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 to back up a little bit again to the, to the uh, this issue with. Uh, with the uh, the vendors on, on these projects and, and, the, and the hiring situation, is that pushing projects back? And then if you push projects back, you're 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 running the risk of running into a higher interest rate environment. And costs keep going up. Right? Define it. What is that causing a real immediate problem, or is that something that you're? When you say project, are you talking the construction process or from right, or even I, a, 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 anticipating? I mean, I'm going to assume you, you have to take an, into account whether you have people on, on the site, uh, whether it's a remodel or a new project? I, I think, I just jump in on the construction, uh, you know, I think on some of these one-off deals, potentially yes, but I, I think for, for some of these developments, they're so well planned. They're, they're, they're planned, uh, typically the developer has done enough work with a particular construction entity that, that they know they're keeping them busy, so I think on these larger scale developments, they're, you're, you're, you're getting response now. Is the pricing as competitive as it was? Three four years ago, probably not. That's that's just the construction construction industry, uh, supply demand. Um, but I, I think as a rule of thumb, in general, on these larger projects, you're able to perform on the time frames that you say you're going to perform on. What it, what what you run into is if you go into you have a retailer that wants to go into retail space and they don't have a relationship now with them lining up vendors trying to do something on their own, are they going to see some significant delays? And I'd say yes. But uh, you know, as a, as a rule of thumb, I'd say on the bigger projects, you don't run into that. Yeah, I, I, I would echo you know, what Mark said. A lot of these, especially these larger groups, are working with large development companies that, uh, um, while that cost of that labor might be rising because of that demand, these big groups, they're going to find people. Um, and, and they may be pulling them from some of the smaller organizations, organizations and whatnot, but uh, they're going to find people and they're going to the, get the jobs uh, done. They're, they're, they're great jobs, they're great uh, opportunities for these companies. So I, I don't see that as an issue. One, um, to, to flip that a little bit, one issue that I have seen a little bit of, which is interesting, is 
uh, labor shortage. Uh, we've seen some retailers um, that open their stores. So um, I think that's had more of an impact um, on some of these groups than, than even the, the keep shortage. hearing about a shortage of grocery store workers. Same in restaurants too. You can you notice when you walk into a restaurant, you can, you can tell when a restaurant's understaffed. Yeah, I don't have the help you want it. Yeah, you know, I imagine that would be, be tough if you're trying to open up even something small like a Roka. So yeah. we, we've uh, <laughs> we, we've seen retailers and heard retailers uh, make that uh, voice that as a concern uh, about the. I was for Des Moines areas three and a half percent unemployment rate. It's been in the media uh, this week, um, and, and that that gets brought up from time to time. In fact, maybe what you were alluding to, Ken, a bit ago, is I think there's a a, a retail store uh, in the market that has delayed its opening by 30 days because they couldn't couldn't staff it. Um, and what I've said when retailers have brought that up to me before, I've said, you know. Yes, there is, so it's a double-edged sword, our strong economy here and the three and a half percent of the rate. It makes it a great retail economy uh, overall. Uh, the the opposite side of that sword is the difficulty in hiring. But I, I frankly think that, first of all, I don't believe that the unemployment rate is three and a half percent. I think it's really probably closer to 10 percent, uh, which is still low for the rest of the country. But I think what retailers miss the point of is that if, if you're going to try to come in here and uh, hire people for minimum wage, you're going to struggle at doing that. But the other point that, that I always make is you don't have to hire people at minimum wage in Des Moines because of two things. First is the, the work ethic here. A, we have a very strong work ethic. So where in other markets they may be experiencing uh, you know, high rates of people not showing up for work, that doesn't happen in Des Moines. Uh, I'm a retailer and I, we, we see this. You can hire good quality people because, because of our strong work ethic. People want to work, they show up for work, and they want to work hard. That's something that a lot of retailers don't experience in other large cities in the country. The other thing that I think is a real advantage here that we stress is the high level of education of, uh, of the workforce that they can hire. And that matters a lot. And once they start thinking about that, then they think, okay, I can pay more than minimum wage. I can pay a couple of bucks an hour more, and when they do that, they get hired. Tyler, if you could, one of the things we talked about yesterday was um, when we were talking about office was kind of this pent up demand. Um, so there's a lot more happening coming, especially coming out of the recession. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit maybe about where you see things uh, in terms of the speed of growth in retail through the recession and, and, and looking forward now. Um, well, I, th I think there's. Public, there's, a, there's a lot of projects that are in the pipeline currently. Um, you know, the, Steve mentioned this earlier, and I, I know I'll touch on it, but uh, he talked about you look at the retailers and you look at their opening schedule, and they're planning stores for 2018 openings right now. Um, what, I, what I don't think the majority of the map people know or understand is the, the timeline it takes to go from, from the time, the conversations that Steve's had today with Walmart and Target, from the time that goes from a conversation to a letter of intent on paper, to a purchase agreement, to a sale of a ground, to an open store, especially for a group like that, you're probably looking at a five-year process. Um, Halfway through your career. Yeah, you know. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, um, it's, you know, and that's for these, these bigger groups. The smaller groups don't take quite as long, but, but it's, um, you know, even, you know, the first, the first store that opened up there on Kennesaw would be Come and Go. Um, we worked on that deal, Steve and I worked on that deal for, for Years. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't a, that, that, that doesn't happen in six months. Um, and so, um, there is a lot of forward planning that that, that happens before these things uh, come to fruition. But um, there's a there are quite a few developments. You know, there's one I mentioned earlier on, along Millstead Parkway. That's that's uh, you know, you drive by today, you wouldn't have any idea something's going on. But the, but the plans are in the works. Um, there's probably. There's easily half a dozen of centers right so, now. Yes, I say, it seems like there's a lot of hubs all around that maybe yep. you know, even pre-recession you didn't necessarily have. You didn't have, remember, but the plans kind of been there for a Prairie Trail or Altoona, but they've yeah. gotten to a point now where now you're in the state where you can be trying One to build those, right? state, especially retail, is you drive by a certain area. So if you drove by Prairie Trail or, or uh, Jordan Creek or wherever, you know, 
three years ago, and they drive by today, you drive by and you see something like, boy, that just popped up. And no, it didn't did pop. I mean, they had <laughs> three, five years of work. Yeah, you, but, you, you, know, drove, you drove me around Prairie Trail in 2009, and I think there was one, you know, one yeah. model home sitting on, yeah, sitting on the lot. You're, tell, you're showing me all the plans. I'm like, yeah, okay, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. drive by today, right? But no, it's, it's, it's this stuff is just, especially the retail segment of commercial real estate. I mean, there's just a ton of planning that goes into it. The absorption is just a long, it's a long process. So as an indicator, if you, because it's so long, uh, such a long process, are you hearing more conversations today than maybe you were hearing two or three years ago? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I'll uh, point to another uh, project that's been talked about a little bit, now Tuna, the, the uh, outlet mall. Um, that outlet mall was first announced, I believe, in the early spring of 2014. Construction coming soon, you know, breaking ground spring of 14. You know, outlet mall. Um, here we are today, and the headline, you know, two weeks ago was starting spring of 2016 construction on the outlet mall. Um, I think that is is uh, now we are at the cost of that that taking place. Um, but you know, a lot of what the, at least that in the other the other interesting piece, and they haven't announced any retailers, and, and, and um, they do that that on purpose. But there is a lot of behind the scenes um, conversations going on with these retailers, where you know a lot of times it's a co-tenancy issue. To get this outlet mall, you might have five different letters of intent that are all contingent upon each other. You know, if you get company, you know, if you get uh, Saks off there, then you get Nordstrom Rack, and you get Domino's. Domino's. Oh, no. oh he's <laughs> a Domino's. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> like, I didn't know they were big. Don't go hungry or don't go hungry. But a lot, of, a lot of those letters of intent, they're all contingent upon each other. If you, yeah, if you can get companies A, B, and C, then I'm in. And companies A, B, and C want company B as well. So it's, you, it's there is the, the dominoes have to all fall at the same time. But it's, uh, um, it's, it's a, it's a long process. It's a long, difficult process. But um, I guess back to answer your question, there, there are more conversations, especially for new construction, um, than we've seen for a while. Um, it would be interesting to see some of the big box construction. You'll, um, Richard had a project on Jordan Creek. Uh, where they did put more Nordstrom Rack um, and, and uh, uh, Dick's Sporting Goods. But we haven't had a lot of big box construction in the market. Um, I think there's there's some opportunity at Ryan's development for that to take place. I think Kettlestone will be one that um, in the uh, in the future, I, I don't know if see that happening in the, you know, over the next year, but they're in that planning stage where they're starting to have those conversations, those wheels are turning. Um, so I think you're going to start to see more of that, which, I, which is good for our market. It is a meaningful ahead. Assuming it is that Ryan has shifted his focus on, on Jordan West from from an office park really to uh, to more of a more of a retail yeah. uh, concentration of retail rather than you know and, and this goes back to the to a little bit of the city conversation um, as well as is, is you can't force demand you can't you, just because you plan an office park you can't force that demand to, to be there for, for tenants to want to occupy that space um, and I think the office park has been challenged fact that there's enough there and it has been enough space on the market that that you can't build new construction and charge the rents that you have to charge in order to make a project work. Um, groups groups have too many have had too many options. Now we saw the first two speculative office buildings construction over the past year and they've done very well. Um, and so and, you know RR has got a one plan along Jordan Creek Parkway currently I think it's about seventy five thousand square feet. Um, one floor fill. One yeah, top four is, is, is spoken for, um, as I understand. But that's, um, you know, Bill Wright mentioned this is like one percent of our entire office market is what that what those three speculative buildings make up. So it's it's a very small number. So Ryan's Ryan companies is, is really just responding to the market and the demand out there, and that demand is for is for good, well located retail. Um, and I'm glad that the, the, the city was was willing to work with them and say, hey. We understand that the demand for uh, new construction office is not there, and if we want this ground to be developed, we need to look at uh, look at Plan B. One of the most successful corridors in the market, as far as big box goes, has been Delaware. I mean, and Chris, I mean, could you? I mean, I'm, I'm interested to know as you know from when that started, some of the key things that you felt drove that, and how that continues on to today with some of the stuff you're doing, you know, south of uh, uh, Sam's Club there. And, Et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, I think as you included, momentum creates momentum. So you kind of get the, those things going. And I think we were fortunate 
lock time into brains and I'll take lock every day of the week. You know, I mean, I think the market was such that when, when we had gone through that planning phase and the retail market was in such a fury during that time frame, uh, Ankeny was was continuing to add, you know, first it was a thousand single family dwellings, now it's two thousand single family dwellings. Um, and so uh, we were fortunate to, to get that built out um, and maintain very, very high occupancy even during the, the downturn. And as you look south, um, that that demand just isn't the same. I mean, you, you back in you know the mid 2000s, you, you know you could build it and fill it and move on to the next project pretty darn quickly. Where now you're having to uh, be a little bit more strategic. When we talk about co-tenancy requirements, and opening dates, and minimum rent provisions, and with the sheer cost of construction and financing, all of those pieces, those dominoes all have to line up because you, know, you can come put a 50,000 square foot box in and if you have to, within you know, six more months, have another 100 open or a minimum rent provision kicks in, that's a pretty uneconomical model that isn't very fun to work through. And uh, although you, know, you, you work through it, you move on, but I, I think that because of the complexity of, of the retailer, Steve, that you're talking about and several that you work with, uh, you know, with those minimum rent provisions, there has to be less, uh, you know, you really have it put together understanding how, you know, the first 50, the second 50, the third 50 all open up so there's no minimum rent provisions as a developer and property owner. Uh, you don't want to be in that position. And so it, by understanding market and understanding the complexity of those items, uh, it needs to develop. And, and, and as you look at uh, what's happened in the last several years, I mean, Mills Wing Farm, uh, you know, first the car dealerships, then Mills, then Sam's, and, and looking at, uh, you know, south of that, I think that the strategic movement will, will, will continue on heading south. Uh, we'll develop 40 acres will be developed, and then another 40, and, and pretty soon we'll uh, you know, develop all the way down to the local woods interchange. Um, Just curious, you might not have the answer to this, but from start to finish in the project, what, what do you think the, I mean, what's your best guess on that? Realistically, um, looks like? looking at where the market is today, you're probably looking at somewhere between five and 10 years before you're built out. Um, and you're probably talking somewhere between four and 650,000 square feet of total square footage along that corridor. Uh, you know, what drives that regional draw is, is the interstate. You know, easy on, easy off, with interstate traffic, population growth. Uh, so, and, and I think, uh, and then we go back to the municipals with strategic planning. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's different product types, uh, you know, across the street from us. Uh, don't necessarily fit with retail. Uh, however, uh, you know the, the fact that that corridor sits between two on-off ramps is near the 8035 interchange and has you know, roughly 70,000 cars a day going up and down. It makes it a pretty desirable place. And then when you talk about Prairie Trail and the professional demographic in Ankeny, and, and you know, I mean, there's some of those demographics versus other markets, it's a pretty strong demographic. It's got the daytime population. You know, you've got uh, Casey's, John Deere. 2,000 employees in John Deere, uh, you know, the Metro North Business Park. I mean, you, you really 3,000 3, employees a day in that park. Yeah, so I mean, that daytime population, I think, has really led to the success of some of that retail. Can you talk about some of those different hub spots where, where they're in the process now where you're actually able to put things in? If you start looking out further, moving the needle out a lot further into the future, do you think we'll, between Atuna and Prairie Trail, nowhere, West, West Des Moines, Milwaukee, and both those areas, do you think there'll be some new areas that also come up, or are those going to be the areas that are going to be the primary drivers for the next, next five, ten years? What, what does that look like? Okay. You have to go to the north, you have to do interchange, well, two new interchanges, right? Uh, what, 836th Street? Yeah, and then uh, 18th and 1st, and 18th and 1st, yeah. There's, there's development land out there. Um, it's probably it maybe seven to ten years away. But uh, like, we're going to grow that way. We're, we're not going to stop. The Des Moines metro area is going to stop growing. And so uh, it's, it's, there's definitely growth in the economy out there. By the way, for the general brokerage community, Ankeny is a, it's a four minute drive from the interstate down by you know, Firestone to, to Prairie Trail or Beer. Anyway, I mean, Ankeny's right. not a sub. I mean, it's not a suburb of Minneapolis, St. Paul. I mean, it's, it's, it's not that tough to get to, you know, for a lot of years. Right. And we're, 
It's out there. there. Yeah. It's out I, know there. Where, I know where Ames is at, or you know, Mason City, or no. <laughs> no. This is my question. The question You're is, five are there areas down, down south, or um, you know, obviously Altoona, with what's going on, are there some new areas that people are going to start looking at, or are these going to be, because there's so much that needs to happen in those areas, going to be on track? It seems like there's a lot of buzz in Norwalk. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know they're working on some, some bigger users down there, and uh, um, you know, Norwalk's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a quick drive to the, so ten minutes from downtown to Norwalk, and it's, it's easy access over to West Des Moines. And there's a couple of golf courses down there, some nice homes, some uh, uh, good schools. So Norwalk's probably another one that's, that's that's kind of on the radar, I would think. Just my opinion. I think Pleasant Hill is an up and coming. They're uh, you know they're they're kind of figuring out their <coughs> identity, and, they, and I go back to that northeast quadrant of Polk County being uh, there, there will be a spotlight on that. If you look at just our county border to the west. There's really not, I mean, you've got Polk County and Dallas County, and there's, everything's kind of filled up on that west, western border, so there's going to be a lot of attention, a lot of resources allocated to that northeast quadrant, and uh, I know for a number of years, uh, and Steve's probably more of an expert on this, you know, Altoona and Pleasant Hill have tried to figure out where they would, where they marry up to each other, and I think they're kind of figuring that out, and uh, Pleasant Hill's got a, a real strong up-and-coming leadership team. They're really rolling up their sleeves and trying to figure things out. Is very very progressive, and she uh, has uh, you know a lot of good ideas, and I think Pleasant Hill's going to be up. Uh, you know, coming in from the west as they go past the bypass out to the, the new high school out there, I think Pleasant Hill's going to be a good community, a good growing community. I think it, you, it, it all comes back down to two things: it's demographics and traffic, um, and that's where the retailers are going to fall. So if you look at the areas, the roads that, are, that carry the most traffic, um, that's that's a good place to look. And then look at uh, you know population growth and housing permits, the number of housing permits that are being pulled in each municipality, each each area. Would Grimes be an area as well? You know, Grimes is a Grimes is a um, definite growing community. It's interesting there. You know, you, you can see. Um, you know, we talk about how the retail falls at rooftops, um, but if you look at where Walmart dropped their store in Grimes, I mean, there's not a rooftop. You know, um, I don't know how, how far, a half mile or not, but. Um, Walmart being forward thinking said, you know, I can see I can see where Grimes is today, and I can see where that population density is at now. And if I look out to the east, I can see all these big rooftops going in, and I can see all the permits that have been pulled, and that's uh, that was a product of, of that population growth and the, and the permits and all those things. And obviously uh, Highway 141 carries a good amount of traffic going up um, to the west and you know, most of the things. So that and the hundredth street probably will make up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's Walmart. All of that area is the north of Grove, so there's going to be a lot of residential development out there. Steve, is it true, you might know this, this is an Altoona question, but is it true that the Bass and Pro Shops is their number two location in the U.S.? Uh, I've heard that recently as well. Bass, the number two Bass Pro Shops in sales volume in the United States. So, uh, I mean, Altoona, it's been impressive what they've done. I mean, they've got uh, um, obviously the, uh, the Bass Pro, and then you've got the uh, the new uh, outlet mall coming in, the new theater. Uh, obviously, Prairie Mills Adventureland. I mean, with everything they've done with the water park uh, in there, which is I don't know once it's open. I, I mean, I've seen some conceptuals of it, and just the amount of. I mean, so I mean, there's there's some people that are heavily invested in them too, and I mean, it's 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 been impressive to see them them grow out there as well. So it's uh, it's just kind of an exciting time. Just the hope is, you know, when's the When's the next plateau off? You know, that's kind of a... Yeah, Teresa talked about this earlier, about um, the experience. You know, shoppers go and they look for an experience. Uh, you've seen a lot of national malls, that some that have struggled a little bit. They've looked at how do we improve that experience. Uh, you look at Rohe Mall, and they, they brought in the, the, the theater. Um, oh, Flix. 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 Thank you. Um, so you look at that as an experience. You look at some of these communities that have like an iPad bowling center that they make part of their retail to not only bring that shopper there, but to get them to stay longer term. That's, I mean, that's what, what Bass Pro has done. Even with them inside their own store, they've got, they've got a restaurant, they've got a bowling center. Um, it makes it really easy for dad to spend two more hours uh, looking at uh, lures for a fishing trip while the kids are, are bowling. So um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Um, but uh, so I, I think you'll see more of that uh, in the retail world where they're trying to incorporate that entertainment value in, 
into uh, into other retail developments. We have about ten minutes left uh, today. The one one area we haven't really talked about too much is downtown. I'm sure that'd be an area because there's some, some other areas that we can talk about within downtown. I'm just curious, your guys' thoughts on um, how retail has been going in downtown and what we might expect to see, especially you know, things like Walnut Street, which is a little bit slower. And, I'm just curious what the looks like right now. My thought um, on, on downtown is, is, you know, I think Walnut Street especially, I think, it's, I think it's challenging to get a retail core um, where you, you have a city street that, that's lined with retailers. Um, I think if you look at what has happened, um, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of spotty retail where, where each building might have a day or two of retail. Um, and I think that that's, that that's worked. And most of the retailers uh, downtown are, are more local, regional concepts than, than, than they are nationals. Um, and that's not unique to the board. Um, you have to get into a major uh, metro city before you start to see a lot of national brands, whether it be an H&M or, or some of those people. You know, that's a group that's been talked about a lot. Yeah, we saw about something simple like you know, McDonald's. Uh, McDonald's, 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 McDonald's I Burger King. Yeah, there is Burger King. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's, you know, and you look at East Village and uh, would be another example. They, they've done a, a really nice job with getting retailers in there. But if you look at the retail concepts that are the most successful, they're, they're going hand in ground. It's a ray gun concept. Uh, you know, um, those East Village, you know, in particular, there's not, I think Jimmy John might be the only national in that area. Which, uh, when you have the strong locals like that, you know, Eichner's got that 300 MLK project that's that's really, really a cool project. But uh, when you have the when you have the strong locals, what you don't have is a group like a Sports Authority that comes in and all of a sudden they have just the tourist or whatever gone, right? So with the strong locals usually build that presence, and, 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 and you do get some really good success stories like you know with Ray Gun and Zombie Burger and some of these other. Um, and you take out some of the uncertainty of as a whole is this is this we're gonna gonna sustain so and those are the type of users that like the space quite honestly you know they're, they're, they just understand the, the local market a little bit better they're not purely driven by traffic counts demographics et cetera, et cetera. et cetera you know they could they could take a little a gamble on some of that yeah. stuff you know and to some degree i think your um, your residents downtown like that mm -hmm. i mean they like the fact that their their t-shirt shop is very young they don't, you know, that they're not going to a national. They take pride in, in that, in that uh, global concept. One important factor is the rental structure. We talked about cost, new construction, rent. To do a project in downtown Des Moines is costly. And so without uh, historic tax credits, state incentives, local abatement incentives from the cities, uh, there wouldn't be that in downtown. They, they, they drive those costs. Uh, the complexity of it, the density and for which they have to work. I mean, you know, there's no, we had a hard time parking today down here. You know, there, there's limited parking. Uh, folks are trying to take existing buildings, existing structures, and work with them as much as they can uh, to maintain architectural integrity within the community. So it's not uh, all new construction, but it has the architectural integrity of, of the old downtown. And those are components that are very, very important as you look at downtown development to that. But if you look at the Western Quarry, the new project like Come and Go's corporate headquarters that uh, they'll eventually put down on the western half of downtown, I mean that's going to be uh, that's that's going to be quite a statement in the state of Iowa, not just in the city, but in the state. And uh, you know I'm really excited for that project to see bringing people from Des Moines International Airport wherever you're coming, you're coming through downtown, and to drive by a project like that and intentionally take them through downtown Des Moines and end up in the East Village, whether you're going to Hankin or West, wherever you're going, uh, it's going to be pretty impressive. Downtown Des Moines is really uh, putting a lot of forethought into the development projects we're doing down here, but the critical factor of that is the abatements, the incentives, because without it, it becomes very, very difficult to have a local business trying to pay $25 and $30 a square foot for one location. Just did you think the city was getting ready to shoot itself on the foot at the church of crime that we got over time during the, 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 the recent discussion of the tax abatement? Uh, there are some people in the economic development folks who, who thought that uh, they should have gotten that path to begin. I think 
they were just, just vetting all of their options as they, they were analyzing it. Is it still necessary and, and, and looking at their success stories? Uh, you look at Brownfield, Grayfield tax credits in the state of Iowa, that's one of the most productive uh, ROIs of, of any project in the state. And, um, and so I, I think the state realizes it, I think the cities realize it. So I, I think it was just a process they were going through with good best business practices. TIF, TIF is a very um, complex. <coughs> Abatements are pretty easy. Uh, yeah, yeah, this yeah. is 13 yeah. years of still no TIF. I mean, you know, it's tax increment financing. But this is why I was talking about the fights. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, the concept, though, I mean, when used in the right way, just in, imperative to what you see. You know, it, I don't know. If you can hear it on the video or not, but you can hear the hammers, you know, going right now. You can look out the window. You can see the high beam going up. Um, it is, it is a crucial piece to being able to develop, especially here in this in the urban core. Uh, when used appropriately, is it is an incredible tool to to spark this development. And it, it's not only, you know, I said tax increment finance. It's not only the property tax that you're benefiting from, but you're benefit. You know, it's. It's, there's a trickle down from the sales that, that it generated, the sales tax that's generated, the restaurants that, that benefit from it, the hotels that benefit from it, the jobs that come from I mean, there, it's, it's not an um, easy structure to just, to just pinpoint and say, well, we're going to get it back through tax, property tax over the next 10 years. I mean, it's, it's a, something for somebody smarter than you and I, Marcus, to figure out. So it's not saying much. <laughs> and as a developer, would you rather deal with the payments or to? In retail, you'd rather deal with TIF because retailers expect that the structure of a triple net lease means that they're going to pay extra for their for their taxes. So if if it's not a TIF, if it's coming in the form of an abatement, then they're just expecting to get that money back themselves. So the developer has to benefit from it. And, uh, that's hard to do with tax. The I mean, it's going in right off, right outside, so they're getting the grocery store in the downtown area. So it's kind of a chicken and egg type. That talk. When we say 3,000 apartment units, so 3,000 3, apartments is approximately at the end of 2016 or 17, there'll be 3,000 units down. You think that alone 4,000? Can you to go on itself? And, and then would that be more retail possibilities? Or well, what needs to happen or for the retail to really take off at that time? Maybe my a better direct question. What type of retail? Yeah. I think it comes back to is that if you're talking big box like you see on Delaware yeah. or mm -hmm. or Jordan Creek, you know, it's just not going to happen down yeah. here, right? I shouldn't say never, but most likely will not happen. But I think you know, as far as the local stores and stuff like that, I mean, there, there's some pockets of downtown. Ingersoll, um, you know, some of the are doing East Village. That's, that'd be a stop. I mean, they're doing some cool things down there. It goes back to what Teresa said about it's goods and services. You have a you have a consumer. You know you have three thousand new apartments. That's you know I don't want to say two a unit. That's six thousand new consumers that are looking for goods and services, and they need a place to get them. Um, you know you look at you mentioned the big boxes and those things. Though that's not a daily you know or even a weekly goods and goods and services item. They they are they are willing to drive wherever they need to go to get to get those items. Um, but the, the daily needs that's what will will continue to grow. Um, as you see more more apartments, more uh, people living downtown. And, and, uh, yeah. So one of the questions we, we like to ask right before the end is uh, if there's something we haven't talked about on the topic of retail, so whether a challenge or a trend or an opportunity. Um, and so I'm going to keep talking. I did this yesterday. So you guys can keep thinking about what it is, and I'm just going to write a pick. So start. Oh, no, you're shaking your head. So right. we'll, we'll start right here. Okay. Well, uh, one of the uh, topics that you had earlier suggested we might spend a little time talking about is the specialty grocery uh, sector or segment we really haven't so much. Uh, I happen to represent uh, the Fresh Market, uh, which opened its door in West Des Moines recently. Uh, they're very high on Des Moines. Um, you know, the, that whole segment is in a bit of a retrenchment. It got a bit ahead of itself nationally. Uh, so we've got, um, in Des Moines, we've got Whole Foods, we've got the Fresh Market. Fresh Time will be opening soon. Natural Grocers is another uh, one that's a competitor in that in that segment, uh, a little bit different from from the traditional specialty grocer. Uh, Trader Joe's is, has been in West Des Moines for what six or seven years now, I suppose. 
Um, the, uh, so I think that all of those will continue to look for sites in Des Moines uh, Fresh Market. We're, we're looking at multiple uh, cities around Iowa. Uh, so they're very high on, on expanding here. Uh, but I think the, the biggest issue with especially grocery is that uh, the nationally those chains have just pulled back a bit. Uh, they, they over they probably overbuilt in a lot of the markets and whether that has anything to do with the point or not causes them to look at the point and say, okay, we're just gonna slow down a little bit and take a breather. I imagine if some of the larger grocery groceries have tried to incorporate some of those I B has done a very good job in that in that uh, category. Um, it was wise of them to see that trend coming and they did it. And you know they're they're as, as good at grocery execution as anybody in the world. And so uh, uh, there, yeah, there's some more competition there, I think. But but, uh, but I know that Fresh Market, for example, still has interest in some more stores in the Metro Des Moines. You know, everything's kind of hunky dory right now with the economy and you know, everything, everything's kind of ticking up. You know, there's going to be a level off here at some point, right? And so that's late 2017, 2018, 2019, whatever that looks like. I mean, there's got to be some sort of a, a correction. So I, I think something that, that really affects retail, right? So it'll be interest, interest, interesting to see if and when that does happen, what type of effect that will have. You have some of this new construction going up, you know, some, I mean, some of the rates are at all-time highs with the new construction. I mean, how's all this going to kind of play out over the next, we call it, five years? So I, I think once there's a market recorrect um, or a, you know, a level off, whatever, um, you know, what's that going to look like? And maybe some of that might be related to interest rates, which we don't know where they're going. They can't go down, I don't think. Um, and money right now is pretty accessible mm -hmm. to grow, to develop. Um, if that starts to constrict, rates go up a little bit, that will kind of tamper and dampen the growth that we've seen here. But right now, I don't see that in the rise. Um, I would say, you know, looking at our market, uh, you know, on a macro level, the fundamentals that, that drive new development and drive the success of retail are, are, are there, they're strong. Um, and I think that's that's obviously a very good sign. Um, when I mean fundamentals, I mean uh, population growth. You know, Des Moines continues to grow. I, I, I remember I always used to say, well, how big is Des Moines? That's half a million people. Well, you know, when you look at Des Moines Metro, it's like 650,000 now. I mean, it continues to grow. Uh, unemployment being very low. Consumer spending is up. Retail sales in Des Moines went, well, went over $90 billion last year. Um, when I say Des Moines, Des Moines Metro. Um, those are those are strong statistics that are that are good fundamentals to why retail's been successful. So um, I think that that level off that Marcus is talking about, I, I do think that, that that will take place as construction costs uh, continue to go up. But I but I don't think that's going to happen in the, in the near future. I think that, that we're still going to continue to grow at a pretty healthy healthy pace for the next you know, couple of years. Um, the one other thing I just wanted to touch base on that we, we talked about a little earlier was. I, I'm, I'm excited to see the outlet mall come out to them. Um, that's a trend you are seeing nationally, where outlet malls historically have located, you know, Williamsburg, out in the middle yeah. of nowhere, you know, <laughs> where, um, where where there's a lot of incentive for them, and there's you know free ground, and, and um, that's where, that's where you've seen them historically. Nationally, you, you've seen them start to get closer and closer to uh, major cities, and um, so I'm excited to, to to see that happen and what effect that has. Um, bringing new concepts into Des Moines, and I see some of these concepts that have, and I've looked at Des Moines past and said, you know, it's not really our market. That might say, let's test it, let's put a, let's put an outlet there, and let's see how it does. And if it performs well, you know, maybe maybe they put a the col the colonization, right? basically putting a <laughs> putting yeah. the flag in, getting, yeah. getting one bay. Yep, and they, 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 you know, they're just testing the waters. Um, I, I read a stat that I thought was pretty interesting that um, the average shopper. At an outlet mall, not only outspends the average shopper at a traditional mall, but they also out earn them. So people make more money than your than your traditional mall shopper. So um, I'm excited to see what what that uh, what that outlet mall brings to us. What we haven't talked about is uh, just future indicators. We're in an election year. So an election coming this year. Uh, interest rates are an unknown. They continue to uh, stay relatively flat. We saw a slight increase in the last 12 months, but nothing insurmountable. And I think living trends and, and, and trends of, of our population in general in the state. Um, you know, what the, the 3,000 apartments we talked about downtown, who occupies that? Is it millennials? Is it empty 
investors uh, is going to really dictate a lot of the next 36 months of retail development in and around the Grand area. So as uh, you know, the, those disposable income levels, is it the empty nesters with a lot of disposable income? We could see a resurgence of higher end retail downtown. You know? uh, and as you look at the suburbs, uh, the makeup of those, I mean, Ankeny, for example, young families, lots of kids, heavy into sports, uh, you know, I'm going to call it uh, Old West Des Moines, kind of the Old West Des Moines boundary. You know, I mean, you're looking for a mature audience there. Um, Waukee, big growth area. Altoona, big, going to be a big growth area. You know, if, they, if, if as that retail comes to fruition, people want to have things to do. So, I think it'll be interesting to watch for the next 36 months the living trends and people trends because that's going to drive uh, the next five to ten years of retail. One thing we talked about after our, our panel yesterday was was the presidential election. In fact, that it didn't come up all the entire time we were talking about office re about office space. So, I'm curious, is that something with retail? I, Hasn't really popped up. Maybe that even at the same tone four years ago, with everybody talking about business plans and waiting to see what was going to happen in the election. Did you guys see any of that in retail? And then and briefly, I'm going to turn time. I'd say I, I think I think it uh, certainly does. And uh, whoever uh, ends up being elected president is going to dictate quite a bit. Uh, you, you can look at you know, GOP races, GOP races, and 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 the candidates that are all running very very different opinions. Uh, some very active on the social side of things, some more active on the economic growth and job creation side of things. So depending where that pendulum falls uh, is going to dictate a lot of what happens, not only in the, in, in the retail market, but office, industrial, uh, and, and where else. And I think it, it's, a, it's an overall economic look. If the, if the economy is strong, the jobs are there, uh, the spending is there, uh, regardless of, of who's in in the presidency, I think the economy is strong, and people have you know that, that, that excess capacity to spend money. Retail will do well. Um, there's some um, conversation for another day, but uh, you know some of the, you start looking at some of the 1031 um, conversations that are taking place about potentially getting rid of that. Um, that could have 1031 exchange. They're, they've talked about uh, limiting or getting rid of the ability to have a tax-free exchange from investors from one piece of real estate to, into another. That goes away. That that would have a very substantial, substantial impact. On How many issue. years has that been rolling around Congress now? Mm -hmm. Longer than I've been in the business. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there's there's a lot of people that, that you know, from a developer standpoint, that these developments happen because they they sell something and they have like kind money that they want to exchange into new development. And if that 1031 goes away. A new development doesn't happen. Teresa, so I'm going to give you a chance to get the final thought for us. We haven't talked about <laughs> anything we haven't talked about. I don't know. I really don't have a great final thought for you, honestly. She's thinking Sorry, we all, we all talk too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all talk too much. We'll go ahead and call it there. Uh, again, my name is Chris Kineski. I'm the editor for Business Record, and, and Ken Dar is our commercial real estate reporter. Um, our contact information is going to be up on the screen. Um, what we always tell people is the best or ideas we get in order for us to do our job best to help educate the, the business community is to, to reach out our way when you have story ideas, trends, issues. So if something today that we talked about sparked an idea or a thought, uh, feel free to reach out to Kent or, or myself uh, and we'd be happy to talk with you. Uh, again, this is one of four videos that we're doing, one on office, one on industrial, and one on land and development. Uh, those will be available on our website, businessrecord.com. The URL will be on the screen as well. Uh, so thank you again for being with us today. And to our panelists, a big thank you as well. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.